Thank you all for joining us today for the What Buyers Want Exploring Market Channel discussion. I am pleased to welcome today's panelists, Stacey Schultz, Chef Jeff Eagle, and Paul Hitchens. I'd like to start the presentation portion of today's event by introducing our first panelist, Stacey Schultz. Stacy is the Director of Marketing and Seafood Sustainability Coordinator for Fortune Fish and Gourmet. Fortune Fish and Gourmet has been serving the Midwest for over three decades and has facilities in Illinois, Minnesota, and Missouri. Stacy joined the Fortune Fish team in 2011, bringing with her a wealth of knowledge in the areas of biology and aquaculture. Stacy, welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you on what to expect when selling fish and seafood to processors and distributors like Fortune Fish. Thank you, Amy. Um, let me share my uh, PowerPoint slides with you guys. So my background is actually uh, in marine biology. I went to Michigan State, um, graduated from there and um, made my way to Chicago to the Shedd Aquarium. And then, um, so yes, I was saving fish and now I'm helping to sell fish. Um, but on the same side, I'm helping to source the right fish um, for our company and help market those products. Um, like Amy said, Fortune, let's see. I can get to the next slide. There we go. Fortune was formed in June of uh, 2001. Um, we're named after the Fortune Brothers Brewery, which was here in Chicago. Um, it closed down for prohibition and then reopened again as a pasta factory. Uh, the owner of our company, Sean O'Scanlon, is, um, is, was his great, great, great grandfather that um, opened the brewery. Uh, we have plants now located in uh, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois, Alabama, and Wisconsin. Uh, we started out as a seafood processor and distributor, and then um, got into some uh, gourmet lines uh, that you'll see behind me. Um, we did that by acquiring other companies and then also just expanding those um, uh, high quality portfolios. Uh, so some of the companies listed that we, we purchased um, were our JDY Gourmet, Classic Provisions, Euro Gourmet, Nesvig's Meats. We have a couple of, or a few uh, retail stores, two in Minnesota, one in St. Paul and one in Minneapolis, and then Empire Fish in um, Wisconsin. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Lobstergram. That's another company that we own. It's an email, um, or I should say mostly email, orders, phone, um, and then ship directly to your house. So that's the only, um, with, uh, in addition to the retail stores, that's the um, business to customer service that we do. Everything else is, is pretty much B2B. Our goals as a company, um, and this is very important, is to learn the goal. One of the things you want to learn as a farmer, the goals of, um, and philosophies of the companies that you want to work with and choose those wisely. Um, for us, it's sourcing the finest and freshest uh, quality products uh, on the market. Um, for seafood, we hand select, um, or I'm sorry, we, we purchase top of the catch. For the gourmet pro products, we hand select those um, from different um, artisans and local producers. Um, and also we do import some of those products from Spain, but mostly just really um, niche specialty lines. Um, You'll hear me mention this over and over again, um, but relationships are key to any of these businesses, um, especially in food. Uh, Fortune's worked really hard to um, make sure that we've got the best relationships in the business so that we get the best seafood available. Uh, we purchase a lot of domestic whole fish when we can. Um, that's so that you can see the full quality uh, of the fish. You can see the eyes, the gills, um, everything. Um, however, in some cases, you have to remove the head. Uh, it also reduces freight, uh, which we get of a lot um, from here at the airport, um, which is located down the street from our operations here in, in um, Chicago. And then um, we are also located strategically between four major expressways, soon to be five. So um, logistics is another piece of, of the puzzle when you're looking at um, who you're going to sell your product to. Um, 
We are leaders in our industry. We partner with the National Fisheries Institute. The owner of our company was actually a board member for years. Um, the um, Food Marketing Institute, um, which is a lot of the retailers, um, and then um, the Michigan, right down to the Michigan Fish Producers Association. Um, we we work very closely with them too. Um, so there's quite a range, and these are just a handful of examples, um, a quite a range of, of the, um, the associations and um, groups that we belong to or work with um, to gain more knowledge and to be leaders in our industry. Um, I've already mentioned our facility. This is our main flagship facility in Bensonville. You can see our processing room there on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but uh, we have a, a large facility. Um, another thing that um, to mention when you're looking at a processor is how big their facility is, how much they can process in store. Um, this area of our building, we do everything by hand. Uh, we do now have a pin bone machine and a flare uh, and a scaler. But before, um, up until like last year, we still did everything by hand. Um, we're FDA regulated. We are certified by the Best Aquaculture um, Producers Association. Or, I'm sorry, Best Aquaculture Practices um, for, for the GAA. Uh, we're third party sanitation and SQF uh, food safety certified. We have over 150 delivery trucks. You will probably now see them um, throughout these areas of the country. Uh, they're the green, green front trucks with uh, the white boxes on the back and, and our logo on the side. So they're basically a you know moving advertisement for us. Um, I apologize, uh, the other state in this picture that we do service via our fleet of trucks is um, Oklahoma. Um, I couldn't get this remedied in time for the presentation. Um, so um, I was asked today to talk about uh, a handful of things that could help you to learn what distributors and processors like Fortune are looking for um, when they're working with a fish farmer. Um, one of the main things is their best practices. So we're looking to make sure that you have, um, you know, a certificate of insurance, that you're HACCP compliant, uh, US FDA bioterrorism uh, compliant, uh, you have your F USDA number, uh, FISMA compliant, third party audit. Um, a labor policy is kind of a, a new thing creeping up in the industry. Um, as of late, probably should have been there for, for decades, but um, we're looking to work with, with companies that do have a labor policy or are concerned about it. And we do ask that you sign um, a waiver of our labor policy, um, especially in the seafood industry. Um, there's been a lot of questions about IUU fishing and um, it's out there. So we wanna make sure that we're not buying from anyone who, who has any um, scrupulous practices, so to say. Um, if you're doing shellfish, um, it's helpful to have an interstate shipping um, license. I, I mean, you have to have it if you're going across state lines. Uh, if you're with it, going to stay within your, your state, then that, that should be fine. Um, labeling, uh, making sure that your, your labeling is compliant. Uh, we've had you know, the last thing you want is a recall of your product um, before it's, you know, really got a chance to thrive in the market. Um, and it could be something as simple as just not putting the allergen on your packaging, um, leaving one out, um, having the wrong information if it's for retail, like nutritionals. Um, so, so that's very, very important. And these are just things that that you would think are inherent in companies, but you know, we found we've had issues with all of these things. Um, one of the things that our sales team in particular is looking for and that we, we really, you know, look require in a product um, and we don't compromise on these things. You know, taste is number one. You could have a beautiful story, a wonderful product, and it could taste like dirt. And it's not going to get it in the hands of chefs or retailers. Um, and it's, it's not going to be a product that we're going to want to carry. 
Uh, we're also looking for high quality here at Fortune. We want to make sure that we're selling the best of the best. Um, and then to that regard, um, you also want to consider the price of your product. You don't want to outprice yourself from, from your competition. So, you know, look at, decide what your MSRP is going to be. Uh, look at other products in the market and see how you would compare. Um, and then also work on margin into that product. You know, your distributor is going to need to make some money on that product also, um, especially if they're, they're processing it like we do. Uh, so we add a processing fee and then you add a margin so that the salesperson makes some money and that the house makes some money so that, you know, when we pay for the gas and, and the logistics of getting it to the, to your customer. Um, so all very important. Consistent supply. Uh, with farming, you would think you'd never have a disruption in your supply, um, but if you do, um, that could that could also kill the product. You know, you get a bunch of people hooked on it, um, and then they can't get it anymore, and then they decide they're either not going to carry it, um, or they forget about it. Is a, is another thing that out of sight, out of mind. So you want to be able to 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 time everything so that you get a consistent supply. Uh, the cold chain is very important, making sure that um, the product is handled properly. Um, consider your logistics and how far it's gonna, um, you're gonna have to travel to get your product to market. Uh, you'll want a unique product. Um, uh, everybody's got a local trout that's just as good as the next guy's. Um, if you can offer your distributor an exclusive, that's also very helpful. And um, customer support. Uh, I'm going to kind of concentrate a little bit more on these two slides here. I'm sorry if I'm going to go over a little bit over on time. But um, for customer support, uh, there's a list of things that are very helpful and will get you in the door with a uh, supplier. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, a distributor. Having a website and social media. I know it sounds like redundant or you think you're too small that you shouldn't have these things, um, but that along with images helps us as a distributor to sell your product. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times I've asked for high quality images from like a farm or anybody selling a product and they just don't have them. Um, it makes it diff very difficult for us to show that product. A point of sale material, videos, um, having really good packaging helps, um, supplying samples, uh, doing any sort of Zoom or training presentations or in-house presentations for the sales staff is, is wonderful and helpful in selling the product, obviously. Uh, customer visits and demos. Um, who do, has never been to the store and bought something because they've tried it or sampled it? Um, so those can be very key things to, to bring to your distributor. Um, and then as far as relationship with your distributor, keep it honest. If you're going to have a supply issue, don't beat around the bush. Make sure to tell them that so that they can have some fair warning and warn their customers. Um, you know, it's, it's very helpful to smooth things over when you have a, an honest, open relationship. Uh, my boss always says if we pay our bills on time, um, that's what we would want from our customers. So that's what we're going to do. So we pay our bills on time. We get the best product when someone's low on product because um, they know that they're going to get their money's worth from us. Uh, don't be overly aggressive. Uh, no one likes a telemarketer. <laughs> I mean, I don't know anybody who does, but um, when you get too many phone calls and too many emails and too much, um, it makes you not want to work with the person. And, and that's just an honest thing. I, I mean, you know, it says keep trying and trying and trying, but there's a, there's a, there's a fine line there. Uh, don't bash other products. We have find this a lot of times, like you have a great rainbow trout, for example, and you think the next guy's is crap. Well, we're also selling the next guy's fish. So we're not going to use that messaging in order to sell yours over his because we're selling both. Uh, we want to sell you both, both products for different reasons. Um, and as far as relationship, um, networking always helps who you know. That's how you're going to, an easier way to get your foot in the door. Um, here are some local resources um, and national resources. 
um, you'll have these slides. So I'm not going to go into to great detail with them. Um, and then here's our website and my contact information if you have any further questions or comments after this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. Next, I'd like to, to introduce Chef Jeff Eagle, the program director and culinary, excuse me, of the Culinary Arts and Hospitality Department at Fox Valley Technical College in Appleton, Wisconsin. Chef Jeff has been working in the restaurant and hospitality industry for his entire career. He has a degree in barbecue philosophy from Kansas City Barbecue Society. In 2017, he was honored with the first Bertoldi Barbecue of the Year for the state of Wisconsin. In 2006, he was inducted into the American Academy of Chefs. And in 2005, he was presented with the Salute to Excellence Award by the Wisconsin Restaurant Association's Education Foundation. Now, this is just a taste of the many ways that he's been recognized by the culinary community for his excellence. Chef Jeff, welcome. We look forward to learning about what culinary professionals are looking for when buying seafood from local suppliers. Well, thank you for that introduction. You know, I, um, it's always humbling to hear those kind of things, but um, where the rubber hits the road is none of that really matters unless you can't make the soup, right? So as cooks and chefs, we need to produce a product and it's got to be good every time. And uh, for the last 25 years of my career, I've been a, a member of the faculty. So my, my product has changed from producing food to producing cooks and chefs. So it's, it's a little bit different. Um, the gray is real, my friends. Um, been doing this for almost 40 years. So I, you didn't come here to hear about my background. You came here to hear about the question that we're trying to address today, and that is, well, what do buyers want? So I'm just going to uh, throw a few things at you. Hopefully, it'll give you some consideration of uh, where we want to go with things. I think it's a, a little bit dangerous to use a broad brush and say, here's what buyers want. Okay, write it down. Now you're set. You know, the, the marketplace is very diverse. If you look at, you know, just talk about food service in general, but then restaurants is a part of the food service market, right? So you talk about restaurants, restaurants cater to all different kinds of customers from the extreme end of convenience to the extreme end of high end, right? So you, you think about product, you think about getting that product to the end user, right? Most of the time when we're talking about this high quality fish, and I've been working with these folks for the last couple of years, you know, we're talking about mid range restaurants to the high end. We're not talking about quick service. We're not talking about buy and fry kind of places, right? But we're still talking about giving the customer a great variety. You know, what do they want? They're probably tired of the same old, same old stuff. So how do we get what the customer, which is really the one who pays the bills, right? The owner of the restaurant's not the one who pays the bills, it's the customer. Because if the customer doesn't come in, the owner doesn't have any money. So it's, you know, as, as cooks and chefs, we're part of that team, as the ownership, as the service, we're all part of the team trying to take care of the customer. And what does the customer really look for? And I, I believe a really big part of that is, is variety. Uh, and so let's focus on fish. So we need to get the product to the, to the outlets that are gonna get it to the customer, right? So what's important? I don't know if any one thing is more important than the other. Um, price is certainly an important aspect, depending on the price point that your restaurant will support or your food service outlet will support. Um, freshness, of course, is a, is a very important part of it, you know, because Quality, there is no such thing other than uh, to survive if you just have mediocre quality. In today's competitive environment, and I know, I don't know about you, I'm sick of talking about COVID, you know, now that we're kind of on the, hopefully on the, the outside looking back at COVID, you know, we're moving past that. In, in Wisconsin, I can refer to what's going on here. We're just getting pummeled with requests for staff because the restaurant industry is certainly on the uptick. And I presume that's probably true in a lot of the areas where you're all sitting as well. People are ready to re-engage in the public. We've got the vaccine that's come out and uh, more and more and more people every day are being vaccinated. So I think we're on the backside of this. So getting back to variety, 
you know, people want something different. They want to enjoy what's out there and it's got to be of a, a good quality. Now, um, I, I appreciated the, the last presenter because I bought a lot of fish from Fortune Fish in my career. So um, I, I wish I had a dollar for every dollar I spent with them because it, it was a lot. Um, so thinking about restaurants are a business. So they also want to make a profit. So when we get this product in, right? We want to be able to take that product, give the customer what they're looking for. Because if I, if I buy a bunch of fish, right? And my customers aren't going to buy it from me, I'm stuck with it. So I want to bring in product that will entice their, their creativity, entice their curiosity and say, this is what I'm offering tonight. This is what I've got going on. I want that to be affordable. I want it to be uh, fresh. And when, with fresh, that means we want to minimize the distance from that product when it was swimming around to the, to the time I get it. The other thing that's a really, really big um, component of this today, and it was addressed in our last presenter, um, and that is given the, the labor market, okay? When you bring a product in, you have to have the talent on staff to handle that product in the form that it comes in. What I'm saying with that is, do you have the talent on your staff to take a whole fish and break it down? When you buy a whole fish, of course, it's less expensive to buy a whole fish than it is to buy a fabricated or processed piece of fish, right? But do you have the talent on your staff to get that yielded well enough that it's cost effective to put it on the plate? That's part one of the labor market. Part two of the labor market is, do you, you know, not only do they have to have the talent, they have to have the time. So if in a, in a tight labor market, which it certainly looks like we, we certainly had it before COVID and it certainly appears like we're heading back there right now, are there enough staff to be hired so that the people who do have the talent to actually fabricate this product? And so what I'm basically saying in a nutshell is that these, these fabrications are probably gonna become more prevalent going on, that restaurants in general are going to want to buy their product ready to cook, as opposed to in the round or in the hole, uh, and then taking it apart. The other part of that, and I, re I referenced the word yield, is that when you take a fish apart, are you able to utilize many or most of the components? If all you're looking for are the fillets, or all you're looking for are the steaks, what are you going to do with the rest of it? So that all plays into the equation. And we help, we try to help our learners understand that as they're going through the program that it's, it's not one dimensional here. But uh, I'm of the firm belief after 40 years in this business, it, it looks to me like the fabricated product is gonna be more and more and more in demand from companies like Fortune and others. Um, so getting back to the source, if we minimize the distance it has to travel and minimize the number of people in between, the number of what we call middlemen, right? It's going to help us get that product more cost effectively than if there's more uh, steps in the ladder, you might say. So I think that's a, a big part of the equation. Who's going to do this? You know, when it comes to menuing products. Okay, it's really important that we work with the person or the people who are making the menuing decisions. So is that the owner? Oftentimes, is that the chef? Probably even more so. Sometimes, of course, the owner and chef are the same person. But uh, what decisions are they making in, in hopes of getting that to the end user? Um, I, I use simple math with my students and I'll say something like, well, if you're going to buy 20 portions, you're going to buy 30 portions for that night. Um, if it's fresh fish, don't you want to move that product completely out? You know, if you don't move it the first day, yeah, it's okay the second day, but how long can you actually hang on to that product before you bought more than what you needed? And now what are you going to do with it, right? You'll figure out a way to utilize it at some point, maybe in a tier two or a tier three kind of dish, but are you getting the maximum value of your investment in that product? And that, that's a big part of it. I've talked a lot about math right here, but 
you know, we're a business. We, at the end of the day, we want to make some money. In order to do that, we have to buy our products cost effectively and utilize them because waste is one of the biggest detriments to the food service industry. So if we can't sell the product, now we got to figure out what are we going to do with it? And we still spent the money, which is a huge part. Uh, so we break down in my class, I actually teach fabrication. So we break down uh, whole fish in our class and we talk about utilization of those underutilized parts you know can you use the belly can you use the row can you do different things like that how are you taking out the bones so that you can utilize the most of it uh, to get it to the plate portion control things like that um so again restaurants and looking at the demographics of your customers um who are you serving and what what are they looking for um, there are some fish that kind of make me scratch my head. There's a, and I don't want to bash at any particular fish, but there are some fish that have been around for a good 20 years that have been, you know, farm raised. They're really delicious, light. They just haven't seemed to catch any traction. It makes me wonder, is it the consumers pushing back on it or has my side of the equation, the, re the food service side, the restaurant side, the chef side, have we not come up with creative, creative enough ways to utilize those products? So later on, when we get into our panel, you know, and we uh, start doing the Q&A stuff, I'd, I'd be glad to entertain some questions uh, on that. Um, on that vein, as far as, you know, what other products are out there that we can utilize? Are people just bored with the same old stuff? Uh, that's why I really like working with this, with this group, because I mean, there's the, the freshness is incredible. The, the sourcing is fantastic and the people are super nice too. And that doesn't hurt um, one little bit. So I'm just looking at my notes here. I think I've covered pretty much um, what I wanted to talk about regarding uh, utilization price and all that kind of stuff. So I think I'm going to turn this back to uh, our uh, moderator and I'll look forward to seeing you all uh, when we come back as a panel. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Chef Jeff. Our next and final panelist is Paul Hitchens. Paul Hitchens is the aquaculture specialist for Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Before joining the SIU team, Paul was a commercial marine shrimp producer in Ecuador for over 20 years, uh, back when that industry was a little bit like working in the Wild West. Paul's also worked with tilapia, clams, oysters, redfish, largemouth bass, hybrid striped bass, and freshwater prawn. Since Paul joined the SIU team, he's really carved out a unique technical niche for the region. One of the services that he offers is a technical service, but he also is brokering fish for farmers that are looking at selling large volumes of fish to live haulers. Paul, welcome. We're looking forward to hearing about what to expect when selling fish and shellfish to live haulers and what some of the advantages are of selling fish through a broker. Uh, thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, let me see if I can get this uh, PowerPoint to work here. Okay, um, as Amy said, I do do marketing uh, for a lot of the producers here in, in Illinois. So um, it's kind of important that, uh, especially when you've got a lot, a lot of small farmers to get uh, one person to kind of organize it because you do need to have a consistent supply and it's hard to do that if you're a small farm. So I'm gonna go over some of the stuff that uh, we do here in Illinois. Hopefully you guys can maybe follow some of this or get some pointers out of it, but uh, we've gone a long way with aquaculture since I've been here uh, at SIU. I've been here since 2005, and uh, we've kind of migrated towards certain species, and uh, I will kind of go over some of that with you right now. Okay, this is some of the fish sales that, <clears throat> that we've done since 2005, since I've been at SIU. And you'll see uh, this is basically an upward curve and it's, uh, it's strictly to the live market sales. Uh, nothing is in here, uh, data from hatchery for fingerlings. This is purely to the live market. So you can see it's, it's been a gradual increase uh, and now we're up between maybe four, 
to five million dollars worth of sales a year. And you'll see some of these are uh, going up. A lot of them are, are on the downward, but they're the, the tendency is is going up. And it's not just because of the demand wasn't there. Is I just didn't have enough fish in some of those years. So um, generally, I, I'm trying to you know keep as much product as I can, as consistent as I can, but it's kind of hard to do uh, because there's just a lot of sales out there and uh, we can't fulfill all of those sales here in Illinois. A hundred percent of what we do goes to the live market. Um, and it's kind of, we targeted that here in Illinois uh, because you just don't have any influence from outside sources like China, Vietnam, if they're gonna start bringing in products. Uh, we had some bad experience with that with catfish of them bringing in some uh, uh, Vasa that was marketed as uh, channel cat at the time when we were first starting uh, with aquaculture in Illinois. So, but when you're dealing with the live market, you don't have to worry about that. Um, all these, uh, countries that can do things a lot cheaper than we can, there's no way they're gonna uh, be able to bring fish in from that far away or through the regu regulations to uh, interfere with your live market sales. These are some of the species in Illinois that uh, we've done in the past or present. Uh, the ones on the right are more um, for stocking uh, from hatcheries, smaller fingerlings. The ones on the left are ones that we've done um, for food fish production. And uh, of course, the ones that I've got highlighted here are the main ones that we've kind of ended up with. So I'll just give you a little background on, on um, how we got to where we are today. Um, the first thing you wanna do when you're selling to the, to the live market is figure out who the buyers actually are. Um, Three main buyers of what we use here in, uh, uh, in Illinois, uh, one basically, but I'll give you the, the options that you do have. You've got wholesalers, uh, retailers, and pond stockers. And I'll go over a little bit of each of those. Uh, wholesalers, uh, that's your preferred target buyer. Uh, we sell about, um, 99% to wholesalers. Um, they pick up at your farm and uh, some of them will accept delivery at their plant, but it's just so much more convenient to have the truck come down straight to your farm, pick up at your farm, take the fish, write you a check and leave. Um, it just seems to be uh, a heck of a lot easier and a lot less hectic doing that. Uh, they do take larger volumes of product and they get them on a weekly basis year round. So um, if you want to move hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish to the live, live haul market, uh, you definitely need to use wholesalers because they can, they can take that amount. Um, each truck that comes down, you can see over here, the uh, size of the trucks they are, they're semis, um, 54 foot trailers with live haul tanks on them. They'll pick up eight to 10,000 pounds of product every week. So you can move a lot of product fast, which is what you need. Um, the wholesaler will take your live fish from the farm uh, back to their warehouse and keep them alive. And then they will redistribute those to multiple re retail markets. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of information on the, on the retail market. Um, they all take smaller volumes of product, usually from the wholesaler. Um, they're generally located in large urban cities and they're not gonna come to your farm to pick up your fish. So um, most people don't wanna take their fish from Illinois and drive them out to New York City. So. Uh, you really don't have an option there. Uh, they sell their, their products still live uh, directly to the general public. So they're taking volumes of hundreds of pounds. Uh, when you're trying to move thousands of pounds or tens of thousands of pounds, 
it's going to take a lot of uh, retailers to suck up that amount of product. And uh, it's just not uh, possible when you're working on a, on a large scale of volume like that. Uh, and the retailers, uh, the live products are actually killed at this point. Uh, usually they gut them or however the customer wants it, but that's when it's actually going to the, to the general public. So person walks in the retail store, sees a fish swimming around, points out, I want that one, and they pull it out and give it to the customer. Uh, pond stalkers, um, also uh, you can use for live market. Um, they take minimal volumes of product and they'll, they'll come directly to your farm sometimes. It's usually a pond management company that wants uh, that type of a fish. Uh, it's kind of a niche market. Um, we're talking less poundage than even the retailers, so you're not going to sell a lot of volume there. Um, they do require a big fish. Uh, it's going to be like for a trophy bass that they want. Uh, they do pay uh, a big price for it. Uh, they may pay up to nine, 10, 11 dollars a pound for it, but you're just not going to move much volume like that. It's a, it, it is a niche market. And you can use that, but you're not going to move the volume that you probably need to move to get rid of all your fish off your farm. Uh, the other point are the pond stockers. They usually only stock in the spring or the fall. Uh, so you're pretty limited on the, uh, the time period where you can, you can uh, sell the fish to the pond stocking guys. Um, what do the buyers actually want? Um, and this goes for wholesalers, retailers, and I you know, listened to the, uh, the other two speakers. We're, we're all on the same page on this, but um, they want a fair market price. Um, just because you think your fish are worth uh, $9 a pound does not mean that the wholesaler or retailer is going to pay you that. Um, the, it's all on supply and demand. Uh, if the demand is up, the price will go up, but you do not set the price. And a, and a lot of uh, farmers uh, that are growing fish say, well, the price of feed went up. I've got to get more money for this fish. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the way it works, it's if the demand is up, the price goes up. So you do not set the price, the market sets the price. And everybody's got to make money on this. The, the retailer, the wholesaler, the, the fish farm, everybody's got to make money on it. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be in business. So if, uh, if the price isn't working for you, you better make some cuts somewhere to do it because a lot of time it, it's not a problem of uh, you need more money for that or, or I can't sell my fish. It's, uh, that is just the, the, the price at that time. And it will vary. But uh, it's, it's the, at the time that you are selling your fish, that's what the price is. Um, they also want a good, consistent, quality product. Um, freshness is, is very important and quality. Um, the best fresh fish you're going to get is a live fish. So if you can get that fish to market, where people can pick that out live, that is the freshest they're ever gonna get it and they'll pay for that. So it's a high dollar product and uh, because you're selling them on, on a live basis. They want a pound and a half size average um, minimum. They'll take a little bit larger than that. But the main reason they want at least a pound and a half is because to the live market, uh, they, don't want, they don't want a fish that's any smaller than a pound. So if you've got a pound and a quarter average, you're going to have a lot of pound fish in there, a lot of way maybe eight, nine tenths. Uh, that's not the market size. If, they, if you do have that size and you're trying to sell it, you're not going to get the price that you need out of it because they can't sell it. Uh, it's going to have to be a reduced price because it's not the proper size. Um, they also want the correct quantity that they ordered. 
Um, if they send a truck down from Toronto or out from New York to your farm and they're planning on picking up 5,000 pounds of fish and they show up and you've got 2,000 pounds of fish, that's a major problem. They've already got calculated how much product they need for that week and they've already got the buyers set up and what they have to deliver. If you don't supply that amount, uh, they look bad, the farm looks bad, I look bad, everybody looks bad. So um, you want to make sure that you consistently give them what they want and the amount you want that they want. Um, accurate total weight, that's to go without saying. I mean, you've, you've got to uh, make sure you've got a scale that's properly working. And um, yeah, you don't want to be short because they do reweigh some of those uh, fish that they're going to bring back. And they also want a healthy product. Uh, and that's just goes to uh, back to the quality end of it. If you're starting out with a fish that doesn't look good from the beginning, there's no way it's going to go from the farm transported on the truck to the wholesaler, delivered at the plant, repacked up again live and sent out to the retailer and then put in a tank at that amount of volume in the tank. There's probably two pounds per gallon of fish in that. For them to be able to handle that, it's gotta be a good quality fish. So um, it's very, very important to have healthy, good quality fish. Otherwise, they're never going to make it to the end consumer. Um, so it, it, it is very important to that point. They want uh, accessibility to your farm for pickup. Um, these are big trucks coming in to pick up. Uh, if, you're, if they're picking up eight, 10,000 pounds, it's going to be a semi. Uh, you need to have good roads. You need to have them rocked. Um, this truck here uh, was picking up fish. It's buried clear to the axle at the farm. Uh, if, if they do that one time, they're probably not going to want to come back to your farm. Um, they're on a schedule. They have to pick up the product and get it back at a certain amount of time. Uh, this is going to be a major problem for them if, if you don't have accessibility. They, do not, they won't, won't want to come to your farm. Um, I touched a little earlier, but they want to assure that the truck returns fully loaded. Um, they need that amount of fish uh, just because they have orders for that. So, and they also don't want to wait around. If, uh, if you're waiting for the truck to get there to start looking for help to load, uh, that's going to be a major problem. They're on a time schedule, time's money. Um, if the longer that truck's at their farm, the more money that they're losing. Um, so you definitely need to have everything ready. So when that truck pulls in your farm, uh, it gets loaded immediately and then takes back off. Uh, they want to travel the least number of miles possible to load the product. And that's pretty important uh, for the location we're at here in Illinois. And probably a lot of you that are you know, watching this uh, in the Midwest, uh, they don't want to travel all the way down to Mississippi to pick up largemouth bass. Um, if they can come to Illinois, pick up uh, the product here uh, from Toronto or from New York, they're traveling uh, a lot of miles less than they would have to to go to the southern states. So they'll give us priority on uh, picking up fish just because uh, it's a lot closer for them to do that. Uh, they also want year-round production because they do pick up on a weekly basis. Uh, that can be a, a problem, especially for small farms, because you may only have uh, fish big enough to sell to the live market once or twice a year. Uh, it, it's just hard to keep a buyer when you're doing uh, a harvest once or twice a year versus, you know, having a product that more on a continual basis. 
So that's where the collective marketing comes in. And that's kind of how we've uh, evolved here in Illinois to where I do most of the marketing here in Illinois. So I can take I am fish from smaller farms, um, accumulate those. If I have to, I could run the truck to get a certain amount from a small farm, finish off the truck at another one. And uh, it works out well for everybody because we can keep keep the buyer with a product on a more consistent basis. And uh, they also want a variety of species to fill their needs. Um, they don't you know, just use largemouth bass sometimes or just hybrid striped bass that they can get out of Illinois. Uh, they also have multiple species that we don't grow here, but if, uh, if I can get them connected here, either in Illinois with uh, other fish that they're using, like the Asian carp you see here, um, I'll set up uh, the buyers from, uh, with people that get fish out of the rivers for commercial fishermen, because uh, they're gonna get uh, Asian carp somewhere. They use those also on a weekly basis. And for them to have to go down all the way to Arkansas or Mississippi to get those species, if I can get them out of the river here in Illinois, that saves them mileage and a trip all the way down there. And they will also pick up the largemouth or the hybrid striped bass that we are also raising here in Illinois. So it's to your advantage to have a multiple uh, array of species that, that they do want. Um, convenience, I talked about that a little bit uh, earlier, but uh, they do, if they can contact one person and get the species that they want, um, it saves them time and it saves them money. Uh, and they do want access to the broker pickups 24-7. Uh, um, when their truck is, is coming down this way or out from New York or wherever, uh, a lot of times uh, they will need something um, picked up on the way and you only have uh, half a day or a, a day to, to see if you can help them out to get that on the truck. Um, they want somebody who's knowledgeable. Um, basically, you, they want somebody that when you're looking at the fish, uh, you know what a good quality fish looks like. You've got to be able to uh, identify the stress on the fish. Uh, a lot of times um, they're gonna notice it. Uh, sometimes the farm doesn't, but you've got to look for that uh, redness on the, on the fish or discoloration in the fin. Um, you wanna recognize those uh, stress features on the fish just to make sure everything is in great quality going on that truck. Um, you also need some problem solving skills. Uh, there's always problems, it seems like, in fish farming. Everybody that does fish farming understands this. And when you're working with the live market, there's a lot of things that can mess up and there's a lot of things that you've got to fix fast or the fish are gonna die or get stressed out. So uh, you, you definitely need uh, experience in solving problems in, in the live haul business. Uh, they want to make sure that you have all of your import or export paperwork, any health certificates you need, and depending on where you're going, um, they're going to need different uh, paperwork. So they expect all that to be in order. They do not want to get to the border and uh, in Canada, for instance, and the, if they don't have the paperwork, and they've got 10,000 pounds of fish on that truck and they can't get it across the border. So uh, that's very important. Also flexibility, if for some reason they are detained where they can't get to your farm when they said, um, I've loaded fish before at midnight just because they've already got live fish on that truck and they were detained somewhere or they had some problems with their uh, their trucking vehicle and 
I had to have to load them at that time of night just to get the fish back in so they wouldn't die. It, it, it's a product that if you got to maintain it live, there's only X amount of hours that you can have those fish on that truck. Paul, I don't want to interrupt, but we are running short on time and I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I think I'm about done anyway. Let me click one more here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and it, it's a good thing to meet in person with the buyer whenever possible. If they're talking to you on the phone and they have the face to go with it, uh, that is a, a, a plus. So uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to ask Stacy and Chef Jeff to rejoin us with video and we'll start to take some questions. So first question is for you, Chef Jeff. What are some of the best ways to communicate to restaurant customers about the quality or freshness of the product on menus, staff education, or what else? Well, you know, I alluded to this in, in my part of the presentation. I, customers are willing to pay for quality and variety. So when you talk about fresh, um, if I were merchandising the product, I would talk about the source and how quickly we were able to get it from the source to the restaurant and to the table. That's one of the things I would uh, certainly um, use to our advantage. And I don't know if everybody does to the extent that they should. I know there was something else out on the chat regarding um, farm-raised uh, fish. You know, it's, it's interesting if you go back, and I, I know I'm, I'm older than most, you go back to the early days of farm raised fish, we're not anywhere near that today. I mean, the quality and the standards, it doesn't even resemble, it doesn't even um, owe it to have the conversation to compare farm raised fish from 20 years ago to what it is today. So I, I in my class, I can only refer to what I do. I help students understand farm raised fish today is, uh, is really, really great comparatively to where it once was, where it was, you know, murky tanks and legitimately, you know, the environment that the fish grows up in is going to influence the taste of the product. And that kind of, that does go into the, where our next question is, um, how do you market your products to customers who have negative perceptions about farm raised? Are people actively trying to counter the myths, outdated information about farmed seafood products? Is, is that to me? I'm gonna set that to the whole group, whoever would like to speak on that. Um, I can. I mean, we we constantly do through our social media. Um, we also um, are part of an organization called Stronger America through Seafood. Um, and we're constantly trying to put messaging out through them and um, sharing what Seafood Nutrition Partnership does to make sure that it's all seafood and not just farmed versus wild. Um, but we do have a lot of that that positive messaging on farm raised fish that, that just, it helps. But if there's someone who's that um, stuck on not eating farm raised fish, they're not gonna eat farm raised fish. That's correct. And I think as far as going to the live market, uh, that's probably your, your only option is farm raised. So uh, most of the people that uh, are buying the, the fresh, you know, fresh as they can get is a live fish. So uh, they're, you know, they know that it is uh, farm raised because that's the only option they've got, so. Just to piggyback on what Stacy said, I think it's super important uh, to remember that if there's a customer that is dead set that they're not gonna do it, I would be really cautious as a business owner to act as the educator in that regard. If, if, they, if they're not interested or they're dead set against it, I, you know, I, I think I could potentially, you know, turn them away from our business by trying to be the educator and helping them, you know, turn them over. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about the whole food service industry today is our consumers are a lot more savvy today than they were 20 years ago. And we have a lot of people to thank for that. 
And so knowing that our customers are more savvy and are more educated and are more well-read regarding the source of their food, that, that goes to help all of our cause, no question. Chef Jeff, I know you have a class soon, so I wanna make sure I get at least one more question in for you. So when we have farmers that are looking at approaching a restaurant for the first time, right? It's kind of awkward for some people to, to go through the back door. Um, so what's okay and what's not okay when approaching a restaurant for the first time? Well, it's a broad brush. You know, I mean, what's okay for one is not okay for someone else. But I, I, I referenced this um, uh, a little bit in my comments earlier. It's you want to get to the menu developer, you know, and whoever that person is, who's the decision maker? Most of the time, it's probably going to be your chef. Um, they're the, the one that, you know, is the at least the influencer on menu decision making and is doing the buying and those kind of things. And I don't know of too many chefs. And again, I can't speak for all. I don't know of too many chefs that aren't interested in exploring new products. So, you know, whether it's a knock on the door, um, I'm, I'm a huge believer in networking. If you want to talk, uh, have a session on networking, I mean, that, that's where everything is at. It's meeting other people and, you know, how do you, how do you touch base with others and what are those circles, you know, and it's, it's not even necessarily knocking on the back door and say, hey, here's a piece of our product. Would you like to try it? But for some, that might be the way to open it. But bottom line is get to the, the influencer. Who is the one making the decisions on what's going to be menued in that establishment? And, you know, I, I think there are some opportunities, not just on the high end of things, but in those mid-price range restaurants, too. I think there are some real opportunities there. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to time. So um, I do want to thank our panelists before we hit the hour. Um, I am available to stay on for a few extra minutes if people still have questions um, or if um, anybody is willing to continue the discussion. Um, but I do want to just thank you all for taking your time and, and sharing your insights with us. Thanks, Amy. It's a pleasure to be on here. Thanks for asking. And um, I'm also uh, available to stay on for a few more minutes if anybody has any questions. I can stay on for a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Stacy, I have a question for you. So a lot of the questions that farmers have are about volume and you spoke about um, con having a consistent supply so that your customers don't either forget about a product um, or lose interest in it because it's not available. Um, so when it comes from like the economic standpoint, like how much volume do you see smaller producers moving through Fortune Fish? So in other words, like how big does my farm have to be before I start knocking on the Fortune Fish door um, in terms of like annual, um, annual production capacity? That is a really great question. Um, it's gonna be species-based. Um, initially is what I would say. And we're really great at helping you manage your product as a small producer. We've done it with a lot of our gourmet lines. Now, when you're working with a live product, it's a, it's a little bit more um, specialized, but um, you know, it, it, it can be hard to say knowing what product you're gonna have. Like, let's say, let's say rainbow trout, um, uh, just because that's kind of an easy, very, um, topical with uh, the Midwest um, product, you know, we already have two rainbow trout suppliers, right? We have one from uh, the Midwest, we have one from um, the uh, West Coast. And so, you know, we can cover our current customers with that. Now, if you also, another thing that's great is to come with to us with your restaurant customers that you're already selling your fish to, and you're about to take that next leap into like having someone else distribute and processing your fish. You know, you know, your volume from what you're selling, you know, Chef Jeff, um, and you know what your volume is with, you know, let's say you've got Meyer as an account. Just, I mean, I know that's a stretch as a small producer, but um, bear with my examples here. <laughs> so you know what you're producing for them, and now you're about to take the next leap 
to distributorship. So you want to be able to produce a weekly amount for your distributor, at least one or two deliveries, depending on what it is. Um, I would say with rainbow trout, um, two deliveries a week, 50 to 100 pounds, just because there's a competition in the market. Now, if you had like your own, your own um, product, let's say Beer Monday from Michigan, okay, brand new, nobody's really heard about it. We've got to build that market um, probably around that same number. Um, but let's say it's perch. Everybody knows perch. We have a hard time finding a year round supply of perch. Um, then we could probably sell a lot more of it, especially in the times when, when the season is taking a dip. So um, it's a really tough thing to pin down as far as uh, that sweet spot in numbers. Um, but you want to be able to either cover your current customers or pass those along to the distributor so that they can sell them them to it's it's kind of a nice start with a distributor um they have that immediate sale and then they can add on to it so they're bringing in that that consistent amount i'm i'm not sure that that truly helps but it it is very difficult and you know if someone's got a specific species and and schedule they want to work on um it's best to reach out to that distributor so a follow-up question to that and i'm hoping that um chef jeff can can piggyback on your answer is um, one of the things that's unique about the Midwest is that we have farmers that are farming a variety of different fish. So we have over 20 different aquatic animal species that are being raised throughout the region. Um, what kind of regional species and products um, are customers in like the food industry or retail interested in? Well, I depending on the operation I, you know most of the chefs i know would just relish the opportunity to find a supplier that has a product and get it out there and see how their customers do now to stacy's point i don't know if you guys caught me smirking there a little bit one of the dangers in working with a smaller producer is let's say my operation um you know i, I try this product it's you use the Barramundi. I mean, it doesn't matter what the species is, but I bring it on and I introduce it to my customers and they love it. Okay. So now I want to get more of it. If I max out the supply to the extent that I, with, with my other competitive competing organizations, buying your product, that I can't get what I need now to take care of this mini market that I've developed, that's problematic right? Because if, if I've gone out there and merchandised this product and prepared it in a way that my customers like, and now they want to come back for it, but I can't get it, now I, I'm not going to be real happy about that. So there's, there's a sensitivity to the market. And Paul mentioned before about supply and demand. Absolutely. It, it, it for sure is. You know, I, here in Wisconsin, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys know about Wisconsin. We're pretty unique place but when it comes to uh the uh, yellowfin uh, perch uh freshwater lake perch they can't grow enough of it i mean it's it's the fish that is preferred for fish fries and you know and we just got through the whole lent season where the demand just skyrockets where people are you know eating fish on fridays and stuff like that so the the point of this this whole question is at some juncture you know it it's 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 a delicate balance because the people who want it are going to want it when they need it for their customers. And so then it's got to be available. Right. So um, you guys talk about small, small providers, small uh, farms and things that, that is, that is a little bit of the, of the catch 22 there. Yeah, that is a like pros and cons of everything. Right. One of the pros is having this really nice array of different products, but the, con is, is that if you're not farming the same species as your neighbor, it's hard to come together to get that collective, you know, marketing power and to be able to have that consistent supply. Um, one of our participants asked Chef Jeff um, how they can get your contact information. Is that something that we can share? Yeah, otherwise I'll just put it out in the chat right now. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Paul, I have a question for you, and this is going back a little bit to volume. So you gave an example of a fish hauler that was moving a semi truck worth of fish, like eight, 10,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. 
but we also have um, two different size markets. I see Chicago as a medium size market and then smaller markets like St. Louis and Columbus. So for somebody who's looking at starting to work with a live hauler who doesn't have thousands of pounds, um, do you have an idea on what kind of volumes are moving into those smaller markets? Yeah, um, usually like St. Louis, uh, they'll take anywhere from 300 to 500 pounds a week. And there's various uh, retailers there that sell that. And those are the ones that I use the retailers for, for St. Louis, um, because they do take smaller volumes. And we do have producers that uh, don't have the large volumes that we need to fill the bigger trucks. I also got uh, one of my buyers that goes to Chicago and uh, he'll take two, 3,000 pounds. Um, so depending on how much the farm has, I'll schedule a truck for the size of that and the place where it needs to go to deliver that amount. Or I'll combine various farms together to get enough to fill one of those bigger trucks if I have to. So there's, there's different methods of uh, helping out those small farms that don't have a lot of production. And it's, uh, it's mainly going <clears throat> to the, uh, either the retailer or combining loads uh, and getting it to the wholesalers. Thank you. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come in from the audience and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so I just wanna thank everybody for participating today. If you do have a last minute question, go ahead and put that in the chat window. Um, this is a webinar series. We're going to take a break in May, and then we're going to reconvene and have our next um, aquaculture marketing webinar in June. Um, that topic has not been locked in yet. So um, you'll be expecting to get two different emails after today's um, event. One is going to be a follow up email with a survey. Um, and one of those questions is going to be additional topics that you would like to hear. Um, so if you do have something that you feel would be beneficial to your farm business, um, please let us know what that topic is so we can take that into consideration. Um, after this presentation is closed captioned, we will make it public and we'll share that link um, with everybody who was able to attend and all the registries that um, were not able to attend today. Um, so not seeing any other questions coming in. Um, I just want to thank once again all of our speakers. Um, thank you, um, Stacy, Chef Jeff, and Paul. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Amy. Thank Thanks you. For the opportunity. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone.